The Stoa is a digital campfire where we cohere in dialogue about what matters most at the knife's edge of what's happening now. Boom. Oh. Welcome, everyone, to the Stoa. I am Peter Lindbergh, the steward of the Stoa. The Stoa is a place for us to cohere and dialogue about what matters most at the knife's edge of this very moment. Um, so I see a few new faces here in the Stoa in the room. Uh, just to give you a brief uh, overview of what this strange place is about. Um, sometimes I call it a communal podcast, uh, but we do have other uh, sessions like wisdom. We have a wisdom gym here. Uh, it's essentially a philosophical and philosophical adjacent event space. Um, you can check out our website for more events. And we've been, uh, we launched since COVID happened. And the idea was to kind of respond to the, the, the mental health crisis, the meaning crisis, the meta crisis. Um, and uh, we've been going strong for having uh, about 400 events since, uh, all for free on the website. And uh, we've been having really awesome guests, including the one today. Oh, I'm really excited to introduce Agnes Callard. Um, Agnes is a philosophy professor at the University of Chicago, author of the book, Aspiration, the Agency of Becoming. And today um, she's gonna share her thoughts on uh, the theme, Can You Know You Are Wrong? Um, and it's going to be in two parts. I'll, I'll take her in a moment and she's going to kind of explain how the, the structure is going to go, but she's going to essentially explain the problem. We're going to have a and a and then we'll have another portion and then follow up with the Q&A. Having 60 minutes for the Q&A portion, if you have a question anytime, you can start throwing in the chat now if you like. Um, have a cue or a question before your question so I can kind of spot it from the, the just the random comments. Um, I'll call on you, unmute yourself, ask your question, you don't want to be on YouTube because this will eventually be on YouTube. Just indicate that somewhere and then I'll read it on your behalf. Um, so I think that's everything. So that being said, I will tag you in, Agnes. Oh, you're on mute right now. Oh, okay. Hi, everyone. Um, a special hello to, I noticed a few of my students, you should have the students are here. I just want to say hi to Ajay, Spencer, Victor, and David North. Um, uh, and uh, nice to meet you to those of you I haven't met before. So what I want to talk about today is um, a problem in, that in some way like unifies um, everything I worry about in philosophy, um, which is the problem of being able to know that you're wrong. Um, and uh, I thought I asked Peter to do this special organization where we would spend some time just talking about the problem and then I'll talk about some solutions that I've come up with to it. But I'm as interested in the problem as I am in the solutions. Okay, the problem is that like it's clear that people are sometimes wrong about stuff, right? We encounter it all the time. People have false beliefs, they're wrong. Um, so like that's probably happened to you, right? You've probably been wrong. In fact, you can probably think back on a time when you're like, oh, I was wrong about that. Um, so it's like a condition that a human being can be in is to be wrong, but you can't know you're in that condition. You can't experience it, right? Because like, you know, suppose I'm wrong about like the weather outside. So suppose that I think it's warm out, but it's actually cold out, right? It's like, well, I don't think I'm wrong because I think it's warm out and I think I'm right about it's being warm out, right? Um, now I could go and check, right? And then I like put my hand out. I'm like, oh, it's cold. And like the second that I correct that, that very instant, like I like as I feel the cold, I'm like, oh, now I think it's cold. I'm not, I'm not wrong anymore, right? <laughs> um, so it's like I can't catch myself being wrong um, because as soon as I realize I'm wrong, I have the new belief, and I'm not wrong, <laughs> right? So as soon as I realize I'm wrong about the weather, I, I now have what I take to be the correct belief about the weather. One way that philosophers think about this problem is uh, something called Moore's paradox, right? Uh, and Moore's paradox um, is kind of this observation that, you know, um, you can, someone can believe something and that belief can be false, right? And um, so it can be like, you know, suppose Mike, who's next to me on the Zoom, <laughs> suppose Mike believes falsely um, that it's um, cold right now in Chicago. 
Okay, so that can be true. And like, I can believe it, right? And I can say it. But there's one person who can't say it, and it's Mike. <laughs> Mike can't say, oh, it, you know, it's, um, uh, it's, it's cold right now in Chicago, but I don't know that, right? Or, you know, I believe that it's warm out in Chicago, though it isn't, right? So I can say that about Mike, but Mike can't say that about himself, even though it can be true. So there are true sentences, like facts about the world, that are unassertable by certain people, namely the people who they're about, right? So that's what Moore's, and Moore's paradox is kind of a way of expressing this problem about knowing that you're wrong. It's like there are these unassertable sentences, right? You can also think of them as unbelievable sentences. Like, I, you know, Mike also can't have the relevant belief. He can't believe it's warm in Chicago, but I don't believe that. He can't have that belief, right? Because if he thinks it's warm in Chicago, he has that belief. Okay. But sort of more broadly, you know, a way to, because you might, I, you know, I tried to, I tried to impress this paradox on my 16 year old and he's like, so what? So there are some sentences you can't assert, you know, whoever promised you, you were going to be able to assert all the true sentences. Um, one way to think about it is just to think about how much we identify the people around us. And these are both people we're close to, but almost kind of especially maybe like public figures or intellectuals or whatever, in terms of like the stuff we think of them as being wrong about. Like there's a way in which someone's, errors almost like define the shape of their point of view from your perspective. So when you think of them, you're like, oh, he's the person who emphasizes this a little too much, or like she, you know, kind of gets this wrong. Um, and, and even with people that you're close to, you can probably pick out, you know, it's almost like you pick out their point of view by thinking about what it is that they get a bit wrong. But now it's like, oh, I can't know that about myself. Like I can't pick myself out. <laughs> um, so that's, that's, that's disturbing. Um, and um, it is, uh, it's like I'm kind of alienated from myself in this way. Like everyone else can know the distinctive character of what Agnes is wrong about, except me, I can't know that. It's like, I can never know myself. And so to me, that's like very upsetting. Um, and, you know, I feel like there's a lot of, um, there's a lot of talk and um, let's almost like bluster that happens because people can't deal with this fact and they think that they can solve the problem through a kind of um, a metacognitive detachment. Like, well, okay, you know, you should just, you should be humble. You should, um, you should always know that you could be wrong. You shouldn't be too certain. You should be sort of skeptical. Um, don't be so sure of yourself. Don't be overconfident. Um, uh, and like none of that, none of that kind of, um, uh, attempt to take a step back from one's point of view actually gives you the thing that uh, I'm disturbed that we don't have, um, which is, it's almost like all, all of that stuff, all of that language that we employ about being skeptical and being distant and whatever, you know, um, it's like uh, an attempt to distance ourselves from our own errors rather than to acknowledge them. Um, it's it reminds me of, do you know this, there's this game where people put their hands like this and, you know, you would put your hands to mine and we push, we try to push each other over, right? And there's this idea of like, um, uh, I, th I think of the skeptical or non-dogmatic or self-critical people as the people who are like really good at pulling their hands away so they never fall over. <laughs> it's like, oh yeah, just be really good at detaching. Just like, don't think anything you think. Um, and then you're sort of like safe. But that's like, to me, that's like the wrong direction. It's not that we should try to be safe from being wrong. It's that we want to know, we want to be able to be wrong and then know that we're wrong. Um, and like know what we're wrong about concretely. Like I'm wrong about this. That's the thought I want to be able to have. Like, is it impossible for me to have that thought? Is, am I just tragically fated to never have this thing that I really want to have? That's the question. So I thought we could start and just talk about that question and then I'll try and talk about some answers. So I'm interested to hear your responses and maybe solutions. Beautiful. So uh, if you have any questions, start throwing them in the chat. We have some already. Um, if you want me to read on your behalf, you just arrive, just indicate that in the chat. Um, Let's start us off with Rain. Hi, I'm so glad you're here. 
I was a couple of minutes late, so I have the first question apparently, and I'm just uh, going to dive in. Um, a a ship that's um, on a course is always pointed the wrong direction. Mm -hmm. You know, may, like maybe a sailboat. There, there, there's a yeah, there's a moment, there's a fraction of a moment where it's pointed the right direction, but then it's the wrong direction. So there's always this course correction. Um, and similarly, from an embodied cognitive standpoint, um, you know, if I go to reach for something or adjust my screen, um, I'm in a continual embodied feedback loop with uh, my environment in order to constantly course correct. So it's not based on, on some kind of um, static propositions about the world that might be right or wrong. It's just a constant state of wrongness that's being adjusted. So if one were to generalize that and say um, that could, that's broader than just ships and um, reaching movements, how does uh, the problem that you stated fit in with this kind of view? Good. Um, so let me give like two responses. So first, um, um, anyway, I'm not complaining that we're wrong. Like I, I think we are wrong about a lot of stuff all the time and I'm not even trying to solve that problem. You might, you might worry, someone might object to me like, why don't you solve that problem instead? Why don't you try to be right? <laughs> and it's like, no, forget about that problem. I'm okay with being wrong. I just want to know that I'm wrong. Okay. So in effect, that your, your thought that like, well, we're always a little bit off. Like I'm fine with that, but I want to be able to know it. Um, I want to be able to be self-aware in that moment of going the wrong way. That's the thing I want you to tell me how I can get. Um, the other thing I want to say is that, you know, when I was talking about the various hand-wavy, metacognitive, detached, skeptical, et cetera, responses to this problem, which are essentially ways of telling me like, um, just stop asserting anything and then you won't be wrong. <laughs> um, uh, one of them is like, oh, everyone's always wrong. Like, um, uh, there's another paradox in philosophy called the preface paradox, where philosophers will start off, or not just philosophers, will be, start off their book by saying, I'm sure there's something in this book I'm wrong about, right? That, for me, that's like humility on the cheap. You know, tell me what you're wrong about. I want to know that. <laughs> um, so the idea, like, that I can know in a general sense that I'm wrong about lots of stuff, that's not good enough for me. Um, uh, I want to be able to aw be aware concretely of the specific things that I'm wrong about. Do you have a follow up, Rain? No, thanks. All right. Uh, Heather, you had a question. You're going to mute yourself. Heather, you're still here. Hey, sorry. Yeah, no, I was, um, I was hoping you could ask it, but I will definitely do it. Um, I am wondering what Moore's Law says about, um, or what comes out of Moore's Law in terms of just cultivating humility in general as an antidote to that. Um, and what, I, you know, whatever you have to say about that, I'd love to hear. Yeah. Um, humility, sadly, um, Humility is not a solution to Moore's paradox. Um, you can't get out of it no matter how humble you are. Um, I suppose, except if you avoided having any beliefs. Um, um, if you didn't have any beliefs, then you couldn't have any false beliefs. <laughs> so, um, but, um, uh, so then there wouldn't, you know, um, uh, on the other hand, you still wouldn't be able to say, like, there would still be another a truth about you that you couldn't say. You couldn't say, like, there'd be, like, some, like, uh, suppose I were the person with no beliefs, okay? So you guys could say, um, it's cold outside, but Agnes doesn't believe that. But I can't say it. I don't have any beliefs. But I also can't say this thing. I'm, I'm still wrong, like, because I don't have this true belief that I should have, right? So... Really, I can't, you can't get around Moore's paradox even by having no beliefs because there's still going to be these unassertable sentences, right, that are um, true about you, um, about the beliefs that you lack, the true beliefs that you lack. Um, uh, and I guess more generally, I feel a little bit like humility goes in the, um, uh, sorry, that a lot of what people mean by humility takes you in the opposite direction from the direction I want to go. Like, that's why I gave that sort of metaphor of pushing the person over. Like, I want to, I want to be pushed over. I don't want to be like really good at pulling my hands away. Um, so, and a lot of the like advice that would lead you to like humility would be ways to avoid error, right? 
And so what I want to say is like, okay, yeah, great. Maybe that's good if you really want to avoid error, if you really care a lot about that. But like the thing I care about is like being able to know my errors. Um, and that's, I, I think that could also go by the name of humility. It's just a different kind of humility. And so maybe it's worth like, it's sort of worth distinguishing two kinds of humility, right? There's a kind of humility that's almost like a sort of invulnerability where you kind of detach and you don't think things so that you won't be wrong. Um, and as I say, you're still not going to avoid certain version of Morse paradox. But I'm looking for the kind of humility where you don't detach, where you do commit, and you think things, and they're wrong, and you know that. All right. Um, and just stop me, Agnes, if you want to pivot to the second part, because we've got a bunch of questions. Okay. Uh, David North, you're up. Oh. Is his mic is not connected. Okay, so I'll, uh, I'll uh, read it. I wonder what Agnes thinks about this issue and the Socratic method. For an argument, sometimes you have to suspend your personal beliefs for the sake of argument. For myself, this often means making assertions I think are false, but still believe in the context of the argument. If Agnes is right about the paradox, how is the suspension, which is necessary for argument, even possible? Yeah, good. Um... I'm not sure that what we do when we argue is suspend judgment. So this gets to, I'll, I'll talk more about this in the Socratic part in the second half, because that sort of gets to the solution. Um, but like we use this phrase suspension a lot. Um, um, like there's a thing that I do say, okay, say so I'm teaching Hume, right? Hume's a philosopher. I don't agree with him about a lot of stuff. Um, that's why I picked him. Um, but when I'm teaching Hume, I try to become Hume. And like, I try to become persuaded by Hume and I'm arguing like, you know, like I'm, I, I'm trying to see the world the way someone sees it who doesn't see causal connections as like really being there as being in things. And there's just a bunch of things following one another. And I'm like, I'm like trying to inhabit that point. And it, it's like, have I suspended um, my, my standard beliefs about causation? I'm not even sure what they are. Like, it's more like now I'm Hume for a bit. Um, and I, in a way, I really believe those things for like a little while anyways. Um, so I guess I'm less sure that what happens in philosophy is that we like suspend anything. Um, um, maybe um, the backdrop here is, um, I think that our beliefs are not very stable. And we have an illusion of a lot more belief stability than is in fact that is then what is in fact present. And so um, there, you don't need to do that much suspending. You're just flip-flopping all the time, right? And so I can just be Hume for a little while because my views about causation aren't very like well fixed. Um, and so I guess I'm inclined to think what happens in philosophy is more like wavering and also more like sincere belief than like the suspension of judgment. Um, uh, and why do I think that? Well, this gets at something that will take us like maybe I may I might not have time to get into, but I think a lot of the questions that we talk about, especially in Socratic dialogues, right? So David referred to Socratic dialogues, questions about justice, uh, you know, what it is to be a good person, what kind of life I want to live. Um, uh, those questions are too important to us to suspend judgment on. Like we kind of can't do it. Um, and that's actually characteristic of a lot of philosophical questions. Uh, so we, we jump to conclusions on those questions immediately. Um, uh, it's, um, uh, and, and so it's not, it's not clear to me that with those questions, suspension of judgment is an option. I can talk more about that, but that's like a, that's like a big territory that I maybe want to wait and see if other people ask about, because I would go on at length. There's some uh, cool questions. Uh, Rob Hart, you had a question. Yeah, let me scroll back and find it. Does Moore's paradox have space for the unconscious or sort of half-conscious intuition that I sometimes feel that I'm wrong about something? I don't know what it is yet, but like I just know that in the back of my head, something's calling the alarm and saying, you're wrong, check your first principles. Yeah, good. Um, so like, um, I think, one of the ways that we often try to get out of contradictions is like sort of like to create a distinction or a division, right? Um, in the self even, right? So you're like, well, 
I believe P, but like a part of me doesn't. <laughs> There's like a little voice or a little, like another person, right? And um, I think that there's like kind of like as a theoretical or conceptual question, I really wonder to what extent those moves make sense. Like they, we verbally, we verbally invoke them so as to not be asserting a contradiction, right? So as to not be like, I believe this, but I don't believe it. Um, and so we're like, a part of me doesn't believe it, right? But if we take like the word unconscious, literally say, like Freud's unconscious is unconscious, right? You're not supposed to be, you're not supposed to be able to like hear what it says. So, okay, we don't mean unconscious. We mean, I kind of think this thing that I also don't think at the same time. Um, and so like, there's this question, what, like, what is that? And I, I do think that if you could, if you could come up with a really good theory of that, a really good account of what it would mean to doubt the very thing that you are thinking, um, I think that would be the beginnings of a real response. Um, but there's, but you need to do more work than just to say, well, there's this other voice. Cause it's like, like one way I could hear voices is like, I could be like, this is weird, I'm hearing voices, right? <laughs> like, like someone else's voices are in my head. And that's not what you're talking about. You're talking about hearing your own voice, right? You're talking about like, no, this is me saying that this is a mistake, right? And so like, I'm saying it's not a mistake and I'm saying it is a mistake and it's one me, right? Speaking with two voices. Um, so like one way to hear that is vacillation, right? It's like, I think it's right. And then a second later, I'm like, no, wait a minute. And then another second later, yeah, it's right, right? So temporal vacillation is one way to, Get, like get the logic clean there but if you have temporal vacillation you haven't solved my problem right because it's like you always think you're right at any given moment it's just that you keep changing your mind and so what you need in order to really get a grip on the problem is this idea that simultaneously you could have this voice it would be your voice it wouldn't be you know it wouldn't be like i'm hearing voices right be your voice um uh and um and you would um, you know, you would take it seriously, but it wouldn't represent sort of, you know, your like main view, right? So I, I guess, what, yeah, what I want to say is like, that's, that's promising. Maybe you could get it to work. Um, that would be the kind of thing, like, I think that's, that's what we mean by a solution is that sort of thing. Cool. Um, ba -ba -ba -ba. There's two good questions I wanted to like uh, Ryan, you had a question on the collective intelligence. I'll post it below for you. You can unmute yourself. Yeah, so, I mean, this doesn't solve the problem, but if you kind of expand to collective intelligence, do you minimize the problem? Because the chance of me and you both being right is, or wrong is less than the chance of just myself being wrong. Um. So, so I think that uh, if a lot of people agree with me about some proposition, then um, the chances that then it's reasonable, especially if it's like an empirical proposition, then like it's reasonable for me to think that um, we're probably correct or something like that. Like that it's unlikely that I'm wrong about that one. On the other hand, I still might be wrong, right? A lot of people can agree and be wrong and then it would be like extra bad. <laughs> so that kind of, um, uh, but like that doesn't, um, I suppose it doesn't really help because um, what what that might help you with is, um, you know, identifying zones of relative safety. Like I'm relatively safe on this one because a lot of people agree with me. But suppose I want to know what I'm wrong about, right? Well, maybe I should gravitate towards the the ones where few people agree with me. But I have that I have views that few people agree with me about, and I think those views are true. <laughs> I think I'm right about those things. I wouldn't have those views if I didn't think they were true, right? So um, it's not like I can go over to the domain where my view isn't shared by many people and be like, oh, that's what I'm wrong about. Because if I thought I was wrong about that, I would just change my mind. And so 
you know, I feel like this observation about like um, collective, you know, the group agreement is really more like in the domain of that kind of like metacognitive take a step back and be like, oh, if I'm wrong about anything, it's probably one of these ones that few people agree with me about by contrast with one of these ones that a lot of people agree with me about. But I don't think I'm wrong about any of it. If I did, I wouldn't believe it. Cool. Uh, bum, bum, bum. AJ, you had a question. Uh, hey, Jay. Yeah. So, hi. Um, so, I guess I'm kind of still sympathetic to your 16 year old's initial reaction <laughs> that you reported at the beginning. Um, like, I'm I'm still having like a hard time seeing why we should be so worried about this. Like, it it seems to me like you can accept the considerations that give rise to this situation that we can't know that we're wrong while we're wrong and still like be able to say like okay i was wrong right up to the very instant where i realized that i used to be wrong and that seems like enough to be able to like um enable us to engage in like practices of self-correction and so on. Um, and like, I think you raised a worry um, toward the beginning of your like initial remarks about self-knowledge. Um, but I guess, I don't know. It's um, like, it's hard for me to feel the force of that. Like, like I think the, um, the like identifying other people by their errors is sort of a disordered practice um, <laughs> that is bad. Like, like I do it too, but um, I, I think it's like probably fortunate that we don't like identify ourselves, ourselves in that <laughs> way. Um, so like, yeah, I, I, I would be interested if you could maybe just like say a bit more to like rebut um, like quietest like arguments for not worrying about the issue. Yeah, good. Um, I'm not sure I'll have enough to satisfy you, but so one thing is like, um, I guess it's like being wrong is one of the fundamental human experiences, and yet I don't get to undergo it. So like, um, like, you know, sort of arguably like the, the, the main kind of like, um, uh, I don't know, what makes a person a person is that she has a power to represent the world, right? So we have, each of us has this like picture of the world, like that we take around with us everywhere we go. Um, like if you didn't understand that people have that, that everyone has in their head a kind of map of reality, right? You would not understand people because that's like a really deep fact about people. Um, but all of us are, you know, mismapping reality in a bunch of different ways, right? And those distortions, like the distortions in my perspective, those are just as much a part of me as the perspective itself. And in a way, they, they, um, they are what like um, make my perspective um, kind of distinctive and individual. I don't mean they're the only thing that make it individual, right? But they're like, um, they, they, there's a reason why they serve to individuate me to other people. And so it's like this map that I have of the world, like it has these proper, it's like, it's me in some sense. And it has these properties that I'm not able to like be aware of. And so it's like, I'm, 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 you know, it's like a part of my life is going unlived by me. Um, and I, I want to agree with you, Ajay, that like, even if that part of my life always went unlived by me, I could still engage in practices of correction and stuff like to improve the map, right? So I don't want to insist that um, being able to be aware of being wrong is somehow essential to going right, to coming to go right. Um, it, it might be for some questions, and I think it is, but, but for many questions, it isn't. So, but I just have like an independent desire to sort of know this. Um, and so I guess I think like, you know, the identifying people by their errors, it isn't just like we're negative and we like to be critical of people. It's something about the, 
um, the process of individuation, right? Like if you just saw the map of reality as being identical to reality, that wouldn't individuate anyone, right? Um, everyone has their own bit of it. And that's like, that's what makes them distinctive. And yet for me, I like conflate in some way, my map of reality with reality. It's like, so I don't see myself. Um, so it's that kind of, it's the kind of self-knowledge, I guess, that I'm looking for that I think is valuable and important. Um, and I think of it as intrinsically valuable. And, you know, you might think, um, maybe, maybe an analogy might be like, there are certain pains of loss, the loss of a loved one, the end of a relationship, right, where you feel this hurt of losing something that was valuable to you. And you might not want to not feel that because <laughs> you like feeling that, feeling that you're missing this thing that's really good and valuable to you is like really important human experience, right? Um, you wouldn't take a pill to make your, the pain of mourning go away. Under certain, certain circumstances you might, but you wouldn't always necessarily take it, right? And that's because you want to experience that. You, it's part of what it is to be you that that loss is really happening and you want to have like the kind of awareness part of it to yourself. And so I'm saying, I want that with being wrong. I want the awareness part. Um, and, um, you know, so it's like, I feel like I'm being forced to take that pill, <laughs> the pill where I don't feel it. And even if it would be painful, I would want it. Um, maybe we should go, maybe, should we, what do you think, Peter? Should we take maybe one more question and then go on to the second part? Uh, yeah, um, I, I have a question that kind of uh, could piggyback what uh, AJ just said. Mm -hmm. um, about like how seeing it may not be a problem. Um, so that whole kind of like, problems that this is just a given of human, you know, existence. And then we have to rely on corrective mechanisms like the Socratic method um, to kind of divide the epistemic labor. Um, but also kind of like what we do here in Stoa, we engage in all these kind of we space, intersubjective practices. So what's your thoughts on the extension of the sense of self in order to respond to this issue? Yeah, good. So that, that really does get to my um, solutions. So I'll quickly give you my old solution, which I still think is, is you can solve this problem in more than one way, right? <laughs> um, so, uh, and then I'll give you the solution I'm working on now. So my first book is called Aspiration and it's about like the process of trying to become a better person but better in some concrete way, like better at appreciating classical music or a better parent or a better student or, um, you know, um, um, yeah, better at like a sport, right? Um, so, you know, but specifically where part of what it means to become better is to more fully grasp the domain of value that is that, you know, that domain, right? So like really coming to see what it is for something to be well done in the domain of say sports or something like that. Okay, so the book is about that process. And what I argue is that when you're sort of underway, like, and you're sort of coming to appreciate it more and more, then you kind of know that you don't fully appreciate it, right? You, you can see that you're missing stuff and so, and some of the way that that shows up is you feel kind of bad about yourself. Like you, um, you know, you're, you're like listening to classical music, but you're like getting distracted every like three minutes because it's kind of boring. And you, but you're like, yeah, but it's not boring actually. I'm the one who screwed up. I'm not appreciating it. Like I'm failing to grasp the value that is really there. I think that is a way of realizing that you're wrong. It's not a mistaken belief exactly, right? So it's, it's not a super great solution, <laughs> um, but it is, a, um, uh, it's the absence of a belief, right? It's like, there's a belief I should have that I don't have um, about the value of this thing. So it's not that I have a false belief exactly, but it's that I fail to have a true one. And I can tell that I fail to have it. And I can tell I'm missing something. Um, and part of how I can tell I'm missing it is just my sense that I'm moving myself forward into a future in which I will have a better grasp. Okay, that's like my first book was about this problem, only I didn't put it this way. 
But now I'm interested in, and that's, that's a kind of diachronic, like it's a, it's a way of saying, let's spread the agent through time. And she can look sort of, she can look from the point of view of the present into the future and say, then in the future, I'm going to fully know. And so by thinking in that way, she can think to herself, in the present, I don't fully. There's something wrong with me now. I can tell. I can feel it. She can even feel kind of shame and embarrassment um, in not getting it, right? Okay, so that's one, that's one way I think we can be aware of being wrong is through aspiration. The way I'm, and, I, and I'm happy to entertain questions on that if you guys have questions, thoughts. But the way I'm interested in right now is has to do with the Socratic method. So I think that one way to see the Socratic method is that like before this presentation, I was sitting here in my office and I was thinking through these thoughts, right? And I was doing it by myself. And I'm like, oh yeah, this is pretty persuasive. This is a good point, you know, talking to myself, right? Uh, I'm, I am, we all are amazing orators of ourselves. Like when we speak to ourselves, we are so easily persuaded, right? So I'm like, oh, this is good thinking that I'm doing, right? Um, Socrates says in the Theotetus, and actually also same similar line job in the Sophists, that thinking is like a conversation one has with oneself. But like, it's like a conversation with somebody who's like, just claps every time after you say everything. You're like, yeah, great. And I think that like, Right now, what I'm trying to do is persuade you, right? So I'm not trying to persuade me anymore. Um, I have a much harder target. Like I have to convince you guys, right? That um, what, right? Well, that you're doing a kind of thinking with me right now. Like um, you're playing the role of me in the conversation I had with myself, right? I've now um, taken that slot, the speaking to myself. I'm now speaking to you. and. Um, I think what that means is like we're thinking together. So the subject of the thought is both of us. But suppose you're not persuaded. I think that's me being wrong. And I can tell I'm wrong because you're not persuaded. And you're like, no, that doesn't seem right to me. And I try another argument. Right? Uh, and this gets back to like David's question about the sort of Socratic method. Um, and um, it's, you know, um, whatever it is that I'm trying to persuade you of, at that moment, I think it, even if maybe, you know, before I didn't, right? Um, and I am pushing that line. I'm not just adopting that view for the sake of argument or something. I mean, I'm pushing it as hard as I can. I'm doing everything I can to think the thoughts that I'm thinking. And you're pushing back. And that, I think, you know, you're, arguing against me and being unpersuaded by what I'm saying is a way for me to know that I'm wrong. I won't say any more than that for now because I want to hear your thoughts about that and I can flesh it out in the conversation. Thomas, uh, Cleveland, you got a question? Yeah, you said um, that if the other person fails to be persuaded, that means you know you're wrong. Isn't it possible that the other person is wrong and you are right? Or did I misunderstand you? Good. Um, so um, I think that um, um, there are two different reasons why they might be unpersuaded. One, um, they might be deliberately like not listening to you. They might have like bad motives. They might write. So sometimes you're talking to someone and you think the reason I'm not persuading them is just that like they came into this, like they literally had plugs in their ear set, right? They're not hearing anything I'm saying or whatever. So th there are cases like that. Those are quite rare. <laughs> um, uh, I, you know, and um, as long as that's not happening, if I know anything, I should be able to teach it to you. It doesn't matter whether you're like um, you came into this. Maybe you were wrong, right? But if I'm if I if I have knowledge, I should be able to give it to you. So if I don't, if I can't give it to you, um, even though you're participating, you're cooperating, you're listening, and you're just like, no, I'm not convinced. Here's a problem, whatever. Then that's on me. Then that means I didn't know what I thought I knew. It doesn't mean that my view is false. So that's like um, maybe what you're bringing out here, right? Um, it doesn't follow that the view that I'm trying to argue to you is false. 
but it does follow that I don't know it. Um, if you know something, you can teach it. So um, I do think that that's, um, you know, we get, we at least get that far in like falling short. There's a great moment in the Lakeys, Plato's Lakeys, where Socrates says, has just refuted Lakeys' definition of courage as endurance. And he's about to move on, but he's like, yeah, and maybe courage is endurance. Let's move on. <laughs> and you're like, wait, you just refuted that. And he's like, Socrates like, yeah, I refuted it. What that means is that I showed that Lakeys didn't know that, but it doesn't mean courage can't, it doesn't mean it's false. It just means that Lakeys wasn't able to teach it to us, right? So yeah, that's a fair point that really all, all that I'm doing is experiencing my own inability to teach you something. Just as a second point, I'm remain unpersuaded uh, because it seems possible to me that Let's assume that you're right yeah. about something. Maybe that's the best assumption. Uh, and um, there are defects of nature, or if you want to be more specific, there are opin alternative opinions the person you're speaking to is attached to in such a way that no amount of speaking will suffice, even if the arguments as given are the correct arguments, something like that. Um, so, I mean, I, you were, you were recognizing that as a possibility, but it just seems to me that's a very live possibility that isn't due to your failure. I agree. So I, here's a way that Socrates talks about this. He says, someone can be a mirror to someone else, right? So when I'm trying to explain something to you, you can be a mirror to me. And when you're a mirror, it's like, you let me see these things about myself that otherwise I can't see. Right. And that's the problem that we're dealing with is that there are these facts about myself, about my own perspective that I can't get into view. It's like trying to look at my own eyes. Right. Well, I could do it if I had a mirror. Right. And you could be the mirror, but you might be like a super cloudy mirror or like a really crummy mirror because you're so like obsessed with whatever points you had coming into the conversation and with saying them that you don't actually allow me to see myself. And I think Socrates prided himself on being an awesome mirror, right? He's like, that's the one thing I can do is be the mirror. And I think that he thought of philosophical conversation really as people being able to serve as mirrors for one another. And philosophers are super good at this. Like if you give a talk in a philosophy department, all of the questions are going to be like, here's why that one thing you said is inconsistent with that other thing you said. I'm going to keep myself out of it, right? That's being a mirror. So I think you're right that um, whether or not I can have this experience with someone else is a function of how good a mirror they can be. And so, you know, part of the story here is we want to be able to be really good mirrors to other people. Um, and this is why I think, for instance, like just in thinking in terms of contemporary culture, debate is very unsocratic. So you have a debate, you have two people and each of them has opinions. That's one too many sets of opinions. <laughs> Nobody's going to be anybody's mirror in that situation, right? What you need is like a situation where there's only one set of opinions. And that's, um, that's sort of what I mean by like, there's just one bit of thinking that's going on, right? It's sort of put in two bodies, but there's one bit of thinking. Um, but that's never going to take the form of a debate. So debate in some way is unphilosophical by this um, way of thinking. All right, um, John, you're up next. You're gonna unmute yourself. John Bay. Okay, I will read it on his behalf. Um, in a context of a world that is constantly changing uh, in all levels of microenvironments to macroenvironments, planets, et cetera, right or wrong is fluid, right? That has been said, even if we are right in the next second, we might be wrong next in the next. I think there are things that don't change. Uh, Slavery is wrong. It was always wrong. It's not fluid. Um, uh, mathematical facts have always been true. 
So there's like a set of facts that are fluid that change, um, empirical facts, right? And I think that um, with respect to those facts, um, if we wanna know how things stand, we have to um, go check. <laughs> so if I do, like, is it cold or warm out? Well, I have to go check. So what's interesting about that go check is that um, I can suspend judgment there, right? So I can be like, I don't know, let me check and then I'll get back to you, right? And I can spend this time not knowing. Um, and so I think the world of like flux and change is also the world that we are sort of comfortable suspending judgment about. But then there are things like moral judgments, right? Like, um, is something just or unjust? Um, where we are very quick in jumping to conclusions. And that's not because we're somehow arrogant or overconfident in those domains. It's because those questions are urgent to us in a way where we can't live even a minute without the answer. We're, we're I think, kind of literally living on the answer. The answer is part of how we live. And so we need the answer to be there so we can live. Um, and I think moral questions are like that. I don't think those things fluctuate, but we fluctuate because we, we give reflexive immediate answers, um, but there isn't a lot of stability in how we answer. And so though we're always giving an answer, the answer kind of shifts and changes. I noticed this, you know, the first time I really noticed this actually was when my oldest son was like little and I would read him children's books. And like the moral of the one book would be like, um, be who you are and it's fine if you're different um, and don't conform to what other people expect of you. And like the moral of the next book is like sharing is caring and like rainbow fish gives a little one of his colors to all the other fish so that everybody can have a little rainbow color on their thing. Like versus Elmer the elephant who keeps all the rainbow to himself and he's supposed to be just like loved for being different, right? And it's like these two books are telling my child contradictory things. So some of that fluctuation that we see in how we respond to the world, some of it is that the world is fluctuating and that's the empirical stuff. But other fluctuation is like, we're screwed up. We don't have a stable moral compass to guide us. Uh, and those sorts of mistakes, I think, are ones that we should try to stop making. <laughs> um, um, because it's not true that contradictory moral claims are both correct. It's just that like we have a hard time getting our bearing and so we're not giving consistent responses. So I guess what I wanna say is that I think that, um, you know, there are very different kinds of fluctuations and some of them reflect defects in us and some of them don't. And the ones that reflect defects in us are precisely gonna be, um, you know, defects where we're sort of taking ourselves to know something or to be able to give it to, to really have a thought through answer to something where we don't have a thought through answer. We just have like a reflexive quick response. Cool. Uh, Stefan, uh, do you want to read your question? Uh, sure. Hi. So basically I'm wondering, you know, there's these different versions of us, the today me, the right now me, and then there's that person me yesterday or yesteryear. And often that, person before makes that commitment for me to execute. Um, if I don't execute, who's the wrong one? The one who fails to execute or the one who fails to anticipate that, you know, I might not be in the mood or I might not have tools or not have this. Good. Um, I, I guess I think it could be either one. Um, so, um, I think that, um, it, it might depend on whether we take that little sort of that episode and what is the larger story that it's part of, right? So, um, you know, um, um, one kind of case is a case where, um, let's say I'm weak willed, right? And so I'm like, um, oh, I should, you know, go to bed early because in the morning I have this thing I have to do. 
and I know that I should do that, but then when the time comes, right, I flip, right? And I'm like, oh, I just feel like staying up a little more. Um, and then you wanna say, okay, what's the bigger picture? The bigger picture here is, um, you know, my real commitments or something are, I mean, it could go either way actually, but let's just tell the story where the real commitment is that I am, um, you know, this thing was really important to me and I really should have gone to bed. And then it's like, I failed in the moment, right? And we do fail in the moment. So like, um, um, but we would need that bigger diachronic story because it could go otherwise too, you know? There's, you could tell a story where like, somebody is like in grad school and like they keep on just getting distracted and like not doing their work. And they're so like angry at themselves, but like, um, um, this happened to me, um, like in many different stages of grad school. Um, I was in classics. I was like training to be a classicist, you know, and I, but I was spending all my time reading Freud. I spent like a year just like reading through the works of Freud going into analysis. And I'm like, this is crazy. I should, I'm a classicist. I'm supposed to be reading Greek. This is not what I'm supposed to be doing. Um, but, um, you know, I'm like, oh, this is so ecratic of me, right? But in fact, it was like, well, that was like kind of a bad theory of myself because I didn't end up as a classicist. I ended up as somebody where these questions about the division of the self and the unconscious were really deeply gripping me. And my weakness of will was in fact the beginning of my inquiry into a certain thing that I couldn't quite see that that's what it was. A lot of times when we're weak willed, that's because we have a bad theory about what like the main background state of ourselves is, right? And we are actually sort of aspiring to be a slightly different person. And so I think that if you want to know like who's right, who's wrong, and you kind of need that longer story. And what that also, what also, you know, follows from that is like, if you only have the shorter bit of the story, you just might not be able to know. And could it be a little bit of both? There's a little bit of this communicate, obviously miscommunication, so they're both, both wrong to a certain degree. Yes, I likely. think that, yes. In fact, I think that in all of the cases, they're both gonna be wrong. There's just a question of who's more wrong. <laughs> um, uh, Cause like, you know, that background perspective of prudence or whatever that tells me I should go to bed early. It's like, if I really knew that, I agree with Socrates on this, that if I really knew that and I had really reasoned that out firmly and it really had taken a hold of my soul, then I wouldn't be tempted. So obviously there's something wrong with how I'm gripping that. And so even that is like wrong um, um, in the sense that I don't fully grasp it in the way that I take myself to. So, so yeah, I think that they're both somewhat wrong. Yeah, go ahead. And just as follow up. And then when there's not like that, but let's say there's just two two goods that are in conflict and you just can't possibly do both or they're just you know so is that the same situation or there's conflicting goods and one as opposed to sort of like the acrasia crazia i mentioned or yeah i think that's really different um so i think that the difference is that in um in the case of acrasia weakness of will we um, take ourselves to know quite firmly which of the two things we ought to pursue. We might be wrong about it, right? but we take ourselves to know it. Um, whereas if I'm torn between two options, um, both of which look good to me, right? Um, I have not yet completed the deliberative process that the Ocratic takes herself to be at the end of. Or maybe I never will, right? maybe I'll just have to pick or something, but still acrasia is not possible until you've completed that process. Cool. Uh, so we have about four minutes. Do you want to close it here? Do you want to sneak in another question? Let's get another question in. Okay. Uh, da, da, da. Uh, Kevin Delan, you had a question. You can unmute yourself. Kevin. Okay. Um, there's a, okay, so that's just a joke. Okay. <laughs> um, I thought you had a question above Kevin, but I'll read someone else's question. Does the fact that experts in science, philosophy, etc., disagree mean that they cannot teach, convince each other that therefore they have no knowledge? Um, so um, with respect to science, yes. That would be true, I think, um, but it's not true about science um, 
the experts don't disagree. Uh, they might disagree on like points of detail, right? Where, which is lies at the margin of the field, right? Um, and that's exactly the stuff that they don't know yet, right? The stuff that they are disagreeing about. Um, philosophy is really different. So um, uh, in the case of philosophy, um, there is, um, no possibility that um, someone can like do it for you in the sense that people can kind of do your scientific thinking for you. Like people do most of our scientific thinking for us, right? So they like, you know, everything I think about like matter is, is stuff I don't really know, but I'm, it's like I trust, you know, the scientists tell me this is how it goes and I trust them. And there's some fancy math and some experiments that I don't know about, um, but like I've sort of like farmed it out, right? So that's the nature of scientific thinking is that it can be farmed out to experts. And the experts had better agree because that's part of how we know who to farm it out to. Um, but in philosophy, the experts don't agree, but also we can't farm it out. <laughs> so um, uh, it's like, suppose like I'm like, you know, like I'm talking to you about knowing that you're wrong and I have this view, but like you have to come to see it for yourself. You have to, it, you, you, you can't just, you can't defer to me, right? You can't be like, well, I'll just adopt her views. Um, and so in effect, um, you know, if I, um, me kind of like counting as knowing and me being able to persuade you and you seeing it for yourself like those are all three of the same thing um, um there's no thing where like i just kind of say it and you take it up without fully grasping it for yourself and so in effect because anyway there's no shortcut around you knowing it for yourself from your point of view like whether i know it or not it shouldn't be that interesting or important to you right can you learn from me is the question um so, you know, yes, philosophers disagree among themselves and, um, uh, but we can still serve as mirrors for one another, right? And we do that. And it's still just true that if you wanna know something, you have to sort of like find someone you can inquire with so that you can come to see it for yourself. And even if we knew all the answers, we couldn't solve the problems for you. Um, so, um, uh, yeah, I guess that's, um, I have to say about that. So that's a, there's a long topic. We could go on for a long time about that. That's a quick answer. <laughs> Very cool. Um, so we're almost at the hour now. Uh, let's close it up here. I thought that was really fun. Uh, and I really enjoyed the kind of the two partners. And I might even do like a philosophical problem question thing at the store where people pose a really rich philosophical question and people just kind of like respond to it. But do you have any closing thoughts uh, uh, for us before I make closing announcements? Oof. Closing thoughts. Um, No. Cool. So uh, I'll make some closing announcements. Uh, Agnes, thanks so much for coming to the store today. Um, this will be on YouTube later in the day, so you can share it, look at it, review it. Um, so upcoming events at the STOA, uh, we have tons of events you can check on the website. Tomorrow we have a, a series called the, the Philosopher Queens uh, with Rachel Haywire and Raven Connolly and Nina Power uh, is coming in. Uh, so Rachel, could you just uh, unmute yourself and plug that uh, event that's happening tomorrow at 3 p.m. Eastern time? Hi, so we're really excited uh, about hosting Nina Power at the Philosopher Queens here at the Stowa tomorrow. If you guys know about Nina Power, she's an ex-academic, incredible philosopher and cultural critic. Um, if you guys know Justin Murphy, they're running an online course together on the Thai. Raven and I are going to be speaking with Nina about everything from sex and men to women and controversy. So please come by and join us at Philosopher Queens. Cool. Thank you, Rachel. I posted that in the chat. So you can also go on the website. We also have a wisdom gym here and we have all these interesting kind of psychotechnology type stuff. And there's a session called Flowing with Unknowingness. Just imagine freestyle rap and the Socratic method just mixed together. Um, uh, that's what you'll get. Uh, Tyson, if you're here, I believe, wanna, wanna plug that for us? Yeah, thank you, Peter. Thank you, Agnes. Uh, yeah, Diaflogos is another new name for it that has come up. And it's, um, 
having a, a group conversation, collective dialogue through freestyle. And it's an opportunity to come let yourself be wrong, make mistakes, be silly, be embarrassed, whatever it is that comes up, let it come out and just have fun with the spoken word. So no experience with freestyle rap is necessary for you to have a great time. Flowing with Unknowingness, that's Mondays at 8.30 Eastern. Thank you, Tyson. Uh, Agnes, that might be the you know the solution to the problem. Who knows uh, about the freestyle rap session? And we just, uh, Noam Chomsky emailed me this morning. He's coming to Stoa, November 16th, uh, 5.30 p.m. Eastern time. Uh, the responsibility of intellectuals, so dope, so excited about that. Um, uh, might be interviewed by Daniel Schmachtenberger too, so that should be cool. Uh, I'll post uh, the website, uh, stoa.ca, check it out. Support us on Patreon if you like what we're doing here and you can sign up for the mailing list. That being said, uh, Agnes, thank you so much for visiting Stoa. Love to have you back, everyone. Thank you all. Thanks for coming today. It was really fun. Bye. Bye. Thank you.